Welcome to Glacial Environments. We're getting towards the end of this semester, and while it's easy to feel like, oh, I'm just another thing I need to learn, I want to underscore the importance of the topic of glacial environments. By now, you're seeing a pattern for this last stretch of the semester that these are interconnected topics. When we learned about even mass wasting and started learning about volcanic hazards and thermal features, and then we went into fluvial systems and groundwater. This is all connected stuff. And as we enter glacial environments, I think you're gonna to begin to see the holistic picture here of how things link together. So let's start by looking at this landscape and the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Love this place, it's awesome. Because you can't help but go, wow, that's awesome looking beautiful. Those are glacial horns. There's only one active glacier and you can kind of see it and put my mouse on it right in here. And this special thing at the end, that's not ice, that's actually glacial moraines. Having said that, this whole landscape was formed at different stages. The rocks are extremely old in comparison to how they were carved into these remarkable shapes that you see as horns. That happened in the last ice age. So you're looking at about from 2.8 million years ago to now. And so the last ice age, while it concluded around 10,000 years ago, there's still ice that happens in glaciers that exist in this area. So as we investigate the importance of glacial systems, let me tell you that they hold clues. Shocker, right? You've been learning about clues all semester. In this particular case, though, glacial ice in particular captures real data. What I mean by that is we can actually see the chemical makeup of the atmosphere when the ice was made and captured in places like Greenland and Antarctica. Interestingly enough, Greenland has the most complete, continuous ice record, and we'll learn about that shortly. We also can see things like the amount of volcanic dust that's in the atmosphere. It settles into the ice. We can sometimes even see uh, biological life, especially microbial life. One thing that's important to underscore about glaciers is they contain about 75% of all freshwater resources on the planet. So you might wonder, well, that solves our problem for needing water. Nope, and I wish it did. It would be a much simpler answer than what you're going to have to learn about today. We need to leave glaciers alone and we need to conserve them and you'll see why. So let's talk about how glaciers form and then we're going to look at some landscapes they create and then we'll talk about deposits. Then we'll kind of factor all of that into what does it mean to humans. Glaciers form whenever snowfall does not fully melt each season. But it's not because snow falls, it's because it crystallizes into fern and then recrystallizes into glacial ice. There's a multi-step process that occurs. So two really important requirements to form glaciers is you need a wet enough environment and a cool enough environment. I didn't say cold enough, I said cool enough. So you need wet and cool enough condi uh, conditions that you don't melt all of the seasonal snow that came in. So it has a time and an opportunity to change from snow to granular ice, from granular ice into fern, and that's F-I-R-N, and then recrystallize into the really compacted material known as glacial ice. So each step along the way, we lose a lot of air. And so glacial ice is extremely durable and dense because there's not much air in there. It's really compacted, and so it starts to flow under its own weight. There are some glacial zones that are important. We uh, call the area in which a glacier adds to its size. It's going to be in the area that you see at the snow line, which is also referred to as the fern line. This is the zone of accumulation. So this is where you're going to see your glacial ice begin to really uh, be 
grow because you get snow that doesn't melt. So if you have an area that is losing glacial ice, we call that the zone of wastage. And that happens at the terminus. So I need to define the term that we call terminus because it's like the terminal end of a glacier. So it's like the toes or the very end of it. It's also usually the thinnest part. The thickest part is in the zone of accumulation where it originates. Ablation is another term you need to know because ablation refers to when a glacier wastes or loses its uh, material, its glacial ice, we call that ablation. So that happens via the form of melting. So we're going to learn about two different types of glaciers and each one produces unique characteristics, whether it be landforms and or deposits. But there are some things that are created by both, and we'll look at that too. Let's start with the continental glaciers. These are the biggest and the grandest of all glaciers on the planet. When I mean grandest, I don't necessarily mean beautiful. What I mean is they're thick. Continental glaciers flow out from all directions, so they're concentrated and the interior of a continent and grow outwards this way. And as they grow, they don't have geographic barriers like sandwiching between a mountain range. Instead, they just grow with thickness over time. And two places that we have these currently are Antarctica and Greenland. But I'd like you to imagine during the last ice age, and if you recall, that was the Pleistocene epoch, we had continental glaciers that invaded parts of the United States in two distinctive areas from two different ice sheets, which you'll learn about in a minute. One from Alaska and then one from Canada that invaded into the United States. Continental glaciers can be thousands of meters thick, and in the last ice age, they were substantially thicker than they are today. So you can imagine as continental glaciers uh, get and consume uh, sea water and sea ice because they make sea ice you could see how that could change the level of sea level that we have and consequently as they melt you can see how that could rise sea level leading to transgressions and regressions they're just one element of that equation we also refer to continental glaciers as cold glaciers because they stay below the freezing point for a majority of the year so Cold simply is a reference, cold and warm, to that magical freezing point. And in most cases, you're going to see continental glaciers staying below the freezing point. Maybe not always, but a majority of the year. When we think about the last ice age, known as the Pleistocene epoch, we had four advances that occurred, especially of this giant ice sheet right here known as the Laurentide ice sheet. And I want you to know there's two distinctive sections of the Laurentide, and so there's subnames for each of these sections. But for the sake of this class, we're just going to call them one unit as the Laurentide ice sheet. But they invaded all the way down to northern parts of, of Kansas throughout Nebraska, uh, certainly all the way through the Midwest. In fact, they were responsible for carving out what we now know of as the Great Lakes. These continental glaciers from the Laurentide came down even into parts of New York, which if you went to Central Park, you could see evidence of glaciation all throughout that area. The Cordilleran Ice Sheet, which is the one that's over here coming out of Alaska, it invaded parts of Washington state and even parts of Idaho, and you can see some very distinctive landscapes. As you could imagine, the Cordilleran melted faster than the Laurentide simply because it was a smaller ice sheet as compared to the Laurentide. The point being, though, is that these ice sheets didn't exist for one straight continuous period of time during the last ice age. They went through periods of zone of accumulation and zone of wastage, which would be ablation. And so we have what are called glacial episodes followed by interglacial episodes, which are warming sections. So it wasn't like it was a big frigid ice box for the entire last ice age. And that's important because of the mammals and plants that we see from this time period as well in terms of the fossil record. The Laurentide Ice Sheet did have four major advances, and they're named after the states in which they most southerly traveled to during each episode. 
So the oldest was the Nebraskan, followed by the Kansan, the Illinoisan, and then the youngest, which was the probably most significant, the Wisconsin ice sheet. Each one of these represented an advance of continental glaciers out of the Laurentide uh, ice sheet back in the last ice age. There's also valley glaciers. So we have continental glaciers, we have valley glaciers. So I can't tell you that during the last ice age, we only had continental glaciers. That's not true. We had valley glaciers and even the Grand Tetons that I showed you in the very first image is pure evidence of that. So they were very plentiful all throughout mountainous regions. Might even surprise you that Hawaii on Mauna Kea had uh, valley glaciers that formed during that time. So lots of places around the world generated valley glaciers. But the notable thing about the last ice age was that we had just huge continental ice sheets. When we talk about valley glaciers, we are referring to glaciers that form between two geographic barriers. And you can see mountains here on either side. This is in Alaska. And you can see the glaciers combined to traveling in between them, right? Because valley glaciers can get above freezing and do often for a large part of the year, we call them warm glaciers. They only constitute 5% of all glacial ice, while continental glaciers represent 95%. They are super important, though, and they make remarkable features. So let's talk about some terms that apply to each and all types of glaciers. When we talk about the head of a glacier, we talk about its origins. And you'll learn about the head of a glacier for valley glaciers here shortly, but the head is always going to be the oldest material. It represents where you're going to have the most zone of accumulation. I see where I pointed, put an arrow ahead here for a glacier. I see one here, here, here. So there's multiple valley glacier heads at these locations. There's also a head point for any continental glacier as well. When we talk about the terminus, we're talking about the end or the toes of a glacier. So this will be the section of ice that's flowed down and that's grown over time, but it's also very thin and it's also where ablation or wastage occurs. This is actually the terminus of Mindenhall Glacier in Alaska. And I want you to notice how dirty it is and also how turbid or sediment laden the water is, which is super common in glaciated areas because of the amount of glacial silt that comes from the weathering and erosion of landscapes and bedrock that glaciers can cause. So as that melts, you can see all the silt here that gets into water bodies like this embayment and can create glacial silt or glacial flour that you'll learn about here in a minute. So again, the terminus are the toes. This is uh, Perito Moreno Glacier in Argentina. Cool thing, uh, my husband gave me a gift to do a virtual visit to this location through just this website, and it was really cool. So I got to have a human being. I took the pictures, they walked around with the camera, and I took the pictures, really cool. But it was neat because I've never been to Argentina and it's on my list to do, especially after seeing this. But this is a great look at the terminus or the toes and end of a glacier. So this is where it's wasting and you see all these icebergs. That is definitely examples of ablation. Crevasses are another feature that you'll see in any type of glacier, whether it's valley or continental. Crevasses form when the internal flow rate of a glacier is not consistent or is uneven. This causes cracks and fissures to form on its surface, especially as the bottom of the glacier is kind of having friction against bedrock and the middle of the glacier is moving at a faster rate than the base of it is. And this causes it to split apart and fan apart. And these glacial crevasses can be extremely deep so if you go to a glaciated area, you need to be careful because crevasses may only have a small amount of ice hiding them on the surface and you need to have someone that knows and is a guide for the area to help you navigate crevasses. This is in Alaska. I took an airplane ride over uh, Taku Glacier and these are just some crevasses. And again, I'll look at the glacial silt. That crevasse is about the size of a football field. Many are smaller than that, but just to give you perspective 
I zoomed in with a, a telephoto lens to get this shot, and it was an enormous crevasse. So you can have small or very large crevasses. That brings me to what happens when you see the crevasses reach the edge of either the ocean or this case a fjord, which is an embayment for a valley glacier. This is where you're gonna get uh, calving, which is when the glacier literally splits apart, usually along crevasses and breaks off. And when it does, it can create icebergs. So that's how icebergs form, is through a process called calving, which occurs at the terminus of a, of a glacier. So let's just imagine that we have picked up rocks by the glacier as it's weathered and eroded the bedrock, and it's been conveying it like a conveyor belt almost, <laughs> moving them, and that big old rock or tiny little rock's been in there, and it gets calved off, and that rock is embedded in this iceberg right here. So when the iceberg melts, it's going to drop that rock right where it is. So you're going to learn about those. They're called drop stones, but we see those, and they're good indicators of, of understanding how a glacier calved and its ablation, meaning how it's uh, losing or wasting away. So how do we get those drop stones I talked about? We get it by something called glacial plucking. And glacial plucking is when you get a glacier that comes over a landscape, and this can be done by valley and continental glaciers both. And water uh, from melting glaciers gets in the joints of rocks and it freezes. And if there weren't joints there, even if it just got on the bedrock, it could form joints over time. Even the weight of the glacier can fracture and create joints and rocks. And as that water gets in there, it expands. And as you know, ice expands about eight times the size of what it would be in its liquid form. And it gets in these crevices and literally breaks it apart via frost wedging. And this is also called quarrying. I want you to notice on this area, this is in many glacier, like in plural, many glaciers. <laughs> That's a place in Glacier National Park, by the way, in Montana. Do you see the scratches here? That's that's actually caused by, by glaciers. And then you see all the fractures in the rock here. That is plucking. So literally, the glacier broke apart the rock, picked up some of it, and carried it away. So when the glacier melted or ablated, it also dropped those rocks. So sometimes they don't drop in, in water. They drop on land. There's a name for those, and you'll learn about them shortly which is now <laughs> glacial erratics. So when we get those rocks that are picked up and plucked off, as the glacier moves, it will carry those rocks. And sometimes those rocks can be the size of buildings. I mean, they can be huge. Uh, certainly the size of cars. They can be smaller like these right here, but both of these were in Waterton Glacier International Peace Park. And this is actually on the Waterton side or the international Canadian side of it. I saw these, I was like, oh, look, they're glacial erratics. <laughs> so I like to think of them as alien rocks because it's like they just got dropped out of the middle of nowhere. They don't match the local geology, so they've been transported for a distance away from the original rock that they were plucked off of. So they're in that ice, and then when the ice ablates or melts, they get dropped right in their place. You can see glacial erratics around the world, and they're just evidence that glaciers once existed. Here's an example of a glacial erratic, and this is very large. This is sitting in the middle of the United States. It does, like, again, it doesn't match the local geology. Where did it come from? So we, as scientists, can actually trace its travel a several different ways. We can look for glacial striations and follow them backwards to the source. We can find uh, literally, chemistry-wise, we can look and analyze the chemistry of the rock, its petrology, and connect that to its source. There's lots of ways we can do it, and also something called moraines. All right, this term is a French term. I've heard it pronounced various different ways, Rocher Montenay, and basically what happens is the glacier may polish up on one side of a hill and pluck out the bottom. This happens both in valley and continental glaciers, and as Rocher Montaigne forms, this is the rough side 
So you can see how it was plucked out. This is that mini glacier again. And it creates this very distinctive landscape that is characterized by where you see. So on the, the polished side or the uphill side, it's very smooth. It looks like a nice smooth rounded hill. And you come down to this section and it's just a mess. So this is where the glacier plucked out the bedrock. Regardless of what kind of glacier we're talking about, glaciers weather and then also erode. Remember, weathering is breaking down. Erode is transportation or movement of that material. And as it does, it produces a tremendous amount of dirt, specifically silt. So we call glacial silt just that. It's glacial silt. And you look at this particular uh, glacier called Harvard Glacier. It's in the inner passage of Alaska. And can you see all the dirt embedded in that? glacier. So it came from, in this particular case, as the glacier came down through the Valley Glacier mountain areas, it just literally weathered out that bedrock and turned it into a flower type material. As that material gets dropped into water, we call that glacial flower, and it turns the water a distinct color. You can also see when glacial silt is picked up by when it's moved and transported literally sometimes thousands of kilometers from the source of where it was made by wind, and we call this loess. Loess tends to be very fertile and is useful in agricultural uh, means. So this is an example of glacial flowers. So you notice how turbid the water looks, and you can see here's this uh, it, the terminus of the glacier is right in here, and you're seeing it ablating or melting, and then all of that sediment's being deposited into a lake. Sometimes you'll notice you see the really blue water. That blue water may be because you get uh, further away from the glacier, you get uh, less turbidity, but it kind of turns this really beautiful blue color. But oftentimes when you see a lake or an embayment filled with glacial silt, it is very dirty, and there's no surprise for that because it has to do with the ablation or the melting of glaciers. One of the biggest pieces of evidence that scientists look for in terms of ancient glaciation are what we call glacial striations. When glaciers move over bedrock and any rocks that are frozen in it drag against the bottom, they scratch it. And as they scratch that bedrock, they leave little scratches behind. So little scratches, several millimeters, they're going to be called striations. We can actually follow the direction of flow of ancient glaciers, even though the ice is gone. We can trace back how it traveled and where it traveled from and where it traveled to and its direction, meaning north, south, east, west, based on glacial striations. Here's some examples of glacial striations in Iceland right here, and you can see the scratches. So a glacier came through this area, scratched the bedrock, and that is an example of understanding and recognizing that a glacier once existed in the neighborhood. When you get a much deeper scratch, these are called grooves, glacial grooves, and typically these are multiple centimeters deep, in many cases meters deep. And so this is actually an area in Ohio's Glacial Groove State Memorial, believe it or not, it is actually a protected area. And you can see where probably large giant boulders, uh, huge boulders dragged against the substrate as continental glaciers came through the area and just scratched the smitherings out of this area. So you, like I said, you can have either one of these by valley or continental glaciers. But these grooves right here were likely caused by continental glaciers of the last ice age. Another thing that all glaciers do are they deposit stuff. And, and the rock material that they pick up is called glacial till. In particular, glacial till refers to unsorted sediments. What do I mean by that? They're not deposited by size like a graded bed would be. In other words, they're just all hodgepodge of different size material all dumped in an area as a glacier begins to, to melt and deposits its material. So when you see glaciated streams, especially braided streams, you'll see a tremendous amount of glacial till and the rocks are all different sizes. That's a clue. 
Another thing that all glaciers create are outwash plains. So this is a shot I took uh, from a plain in uh, New Zealand on the South Island, right near Queenstown. And if you get to go to this place, oh, it's near a place called Milford Sound, which is my absolute favorite place I've ever been to on the planet thus far. <laughs> Hope to get to go again. But as glaciers begin to ablate or melt, they will start to create a very large section at the terminus. Remember, that's the toes or end of a glacier. And they'll release glacial silt, till, all those unsorted sediments, and they make this kind of landscape right here, which is called an outwash plain. Now, remember me talking about this iceberg right here. And I can't guarantee you that this iceberg has rocks in it, but let's just say it does for the, for the sake of learning. And that stone would be anything that this glacier, the Perito Marino Glacier in Argentina, picked up. And I want to point out, it was really cool on my virtual experience. Do you see the ripples in the water here? There was calving that occurred on the spot when we were here. So I, it wasn't video, like I, we couldn't catch it on video, but I could take still shots. And what was interesting was most of the calving was happening at subsurface because this glacier is, <laughs> there's stuff beneath the water, right? Just like an iceberg would be. And we can start to see the ripples come out in the ablation right here where you see that melted material. And it was going outwards toward this iceberg. So the iceberg is simply stuff that calved off like the crevasses and the terminus here. And let's say that this little iceberg, it wasn't so little really, it was pretty big, actually had stones in it. So when it melted, it would drop those stones and this would be an example of that. Notice there's very flat sedimentary layers except for this big stone dropped in the middle of it. So this rock material is like silt, specifically silt stone. And you can go, oh, well, yeah, I, I see that now because I learned about glacial silt and glacial flour. It deposits in these embayments or in the ocean right where it is. And then you get this big stone that's in the middle of it. It's not a conglomerate. It's just a random big thing in the middle of fine grained sediments. That's an indicator that that iceberg capped off and there was a stone in it and it dropped when it melted right in the middle of this embayment. So that brings us to learning about barbs. Barbs are lines of strata that represent seasonal ablation of glaciers or melting of glaciers. So the thicker a barb the thicker amount of glacial silt was deposited, such as the silt that you see from this glacier in Alaska. And it's putting into this embayment, and you can just see how, how dirty this is, right? So this particular year would have been a very, probably a thicker barb because there was a lot more melting going on, and I bet you now it's even more so. So the thicker the barb, the thicker the annual deposition of silt. The thinner the barb, probably the cooler the year and the less ablation that you had or the less calving that you had. So barbs and drop stones go together, but barbs are very useful to scientists to help kind of piece together seasonal temperature changes in regions for ancient glaciers because we still have the rock material, right? We still have the rock layers, the silt layers. All right. Every glacier makes moraines, but there are certain moraines that are unique to only one type of glacier, which are valleys. But we're going to look at the ones created by both first, and then I'll talk about the valley ones separate. Glaciers, remember, they're plowing through it, they're, especially their valley glaciers, along a mountain, so they're cutting on their sides underneath. If they're continental glaciers, they've got the weight, just massive thickness, and they're plucking along the way. And nevertheless, all glaciers pick up rock and make glacial silt. As they melt, certain deposits get either put on the ground, on the sides, or on the end, or in between where glaciers may meet together. And so this would be an example. This is in the Montana side of Glacier National Park. And this would have been uh, some moraines left behind in Glacier National Park. So you could imagine that literally the glaciers in the last ice age came all the way up here, at least to here, because of how steep those walls are. That tells us that the glaciers were a lot bigger than what they are today. 
The absolute most important moraine of any of them are terminal moraines. Now, going back to terminus, yes, they are related. Terminal moraines represent the furthest travel extent of any glacier. So they drop moraines at the front of them, just like this one is right here in Alaska. Scientists look for terminal moraines. So once the ice is long gone, we can still find the terminal moraines. And again, they represent the furthest travel extent of a glacier. They're super important for scientists trying to unravel, well, what were the different ice advances of the last ice age? How far did they travel? And they're based on terminal moraines, glacial striations, glacial erratics, all the clues I've been telling you about. But terminal moraines are the most important because they tell us how far the terminus traveled or the end of that glacier traveled when it existed. Recessional moraines tell us when a glacier begins to ablate or start to melt, right? So both valley and continental glaciers deposit recessional moraines as their terminus retreats. And I don't know if I really like the term retreats for a glacier, but basically what happens is it melts. So it's either growing or it's uh, staying in a neutral position, which means it's, it's not gaining growth because it's not growing or it's not melting. But a recessional moraine does indicate that we have ablation or melting occurring, and so you'll see deposits moving backwards. So if this was your terminal moraine right here, this might re represent a uh, different recessional moraine. And this picture right here shows the uh, recessional. Let's say this big bump, bump right here that you can't see would be the terminal moraine. So this one right here, this would be another recessional moraine. So another term that people call recessional moraines or end moraines, but I don't want to confuse you with that because I want you to understand there's a difference between a terminal moraine and a recessional moraine. They each represent different things. Ground moraines are the rock material that gets deposited at the bottom of a glacier. So remember I said Mauna Kea in Hawaii has uh, glacial moraines? They do, and here it is right here. I took this shot in Hawaii. <laughs> So it doesn't matter which type of glacier we're talking about, valley or continental, they each can produce what we call moraine deposits. So that's glacial till, and you'll see sporadic rock material that gets deposited at the base of the glaciers, and that is called ground moraine. All right, now we're going to shift gears and talk about several moraine deposits that are unique only to valley glaciers. And the reason they're unique to them is you have to have a restricted geographic area, like a mountain, to cause them. So let's talk about lateral moraines first. I want you to check out this big section of sediments where it says lateral moraines. And then I want you to come to this diagram. And do you see where along where the glacier is depositing sediment along the edges of these mountains? Those are called lateral moraines. You obviously cannot make that unless you have some topographic geographic barrier like a mountain to do it. So they're unique only to valley glaciers. So the moraines that form along the edges, we call those the lateral moraines. Think about a highway. These would be your emergency sides of every a highway or interstate and so they're against the highway. Think about the highway being the glacier itself and the mountain being uh, either side of the interstate. When you see a lateral moraine here in South America, this is not too far from where I got to do my virtual uh, field trip, and you can see all of these deposits here. These are lateral moraines and they're going to be lateral moraines up here along this stretch right here. So when the valley glacier is gone, it's completely melted away. You're still going to have these moraine deposits left behind. Another type of moraine that's unique only to valley glaciers are medial moraines. They're my personal favorite besides terminal moraines, and here's why I love them. When you get two or more glaciers coming out of a glaciated mountainous region where their lateral moraines join, 
They make dark stripes in like these right in here. Here's another one here, another one here, another one here. It's like a interchange system of highways for all these different glaciers. So there's a glacier coming from this mountain, one from this mountain, one from this mountain, one from this mountain, one from this mountain. And where they start to join up their lateral moraines, they become what we call medial moraines. They're really awesome looking. Can you see the medial moraines in this picture? Pretty remarkable. So again, these are only valley glacier deposits and you can only form them there. So let's see if you can figure out the different moraines. Let's start with this question mark right here. So it's along the edge. What would you call that? Thinking about it, I'm not gonna tell you just yet. Here's the one where two valley glaciers join up and their lateral moraines meet. That is called, you guessed it, a medial moraine. So these are your lateral ones right here. All right, the farthest travel extent, what would that be called? And if you guessed a terminal moraine, you are correct. But see these little bumps right here and here, these would represent recessional moraines. So what type of moraine where you see these two valley glaciers, one from this side, one from this side coming down, what would form in between them? What about this one at the base of it, representing the farthest travel extent? What about the moraines that are forming along the edge of the mountains where the ice is traveling? So if you call this a medial moraine, you were correct. If you call this a terminal moraine, that is accurate. And certainly where the two join up together, that is going to be your medial moraine. Remember, they're unique to valley glaciers. Now, the terminus or terminal moraine is, can be in any glacier. All right, so look at this. I'm going to tell you this is the furthest travel extent of a glacier, so you can tell me what that represents. And by now, you should know this is the terminus of a glacier, so that should be your clue. Yep, that's a terminal moraine. You get multiple valley glaciers coming in, and their moraines meet in the middle. What do we call that? indeed a medial moraine. All right, you get moraine deposits on the side. What do we call those? Yep, lateral moraines. All right, so you look at these moraines and let's say this represents the farthest travel extent. Again, a terminal moraine. Ah, what kind of deposit do you see? Notice how murky the water is. What is that stuff called? So if you said glacial silt slash flower, you are correct. All right, the red represents seasonal deposition of glacial silt and flower into, let's say, a lake or an embayment. And then you see the big rock that came out of that iceberg that I was showing you. So what are the names for these two? What's the rock called? An easy one. Drop stone. And the annual deposition represents the barbs. The thicker the barb, the more melting you had. The thinner it is, the cooler and less ablation occurred. Again, what would we call this entire area? Now, I'm not saying this stuff right here. I'm talking about this entire area where ablation is occurring. And that would be the outwash plain. These are random rocks dropped by the glaciers that used to be here in the last ice age. They don't match the ground that they're on, meaning the geology, so they got plucked off and carried a long distance away from their location or, or origin. So what do we call those? They're not drop stones, because remember drop stones are what fall into lakes or embayments. These are what drop on the ground. They are called glacial erratics. All right, that moves us into looking at features that are made by valley glaciers and valley glaciers alone. So notice the very steep sections right in here. This is a special valley glacier feature up here where the head of the glacier is. You can see another head right here. That's a unique thing. That's only going to be found in valley glaciers. So let's learn about them and teach you a little bit about it. So, notice that there's ice in the left picture in Alaska. This is over in near Portage. So if you take a cruise and you're porting out of Alaska near Anchorage, this is where you would stop at this location actually before you get on the cruise. 
But if all the sides was gone, it would look just like this. It would be a giant U shape. So what's important about that is rivers make this shape. They make Bs. B for victorious, right? U shape valleys can only be made by glaciers. And they're the only thing that makes a landscape have that shape because glaciers straighten out the valley floor and instead of being carved down, they're carved more flat. So it gives the base of it a U looking profile. And it makes the mountainsides really steep. That's why U-shaped valleys can only be found and associated with valley glaciers. So I'm over here, and while it's Glacier National Park, you're like, duh, that's going to be created by glaciers. Let's say you didn't know it was Glacier National Park, and you saw that U-shaped valley there. That would tell you that a valley glacier used to be there at some point in geologic past. All right, my personal favorite of every glacial feature is this one, fjords. Fjords are when you get a U-shaped valley that floods with water, and typically they're an embayment like this one. So I was telling you about the South Island of New Zealand. This is the place, the most beautiful place I've ever been in the, on the planet, called Milford Sound. And a sound is a deep embayment, but not all sounds are fjords. In this particular case, it is. So if we removed all the water or drained the ocean here, <laughs> they would see a big giant U-shaped profile and these really steep walls where the valley glacier from the last ice age, or and I would say plural glaciers, carved out this area. Many fjords have beautiful waterfalls, spectacular things called hanging valleys, which I'll show you in just a second. But they're remarkable, they're beautiful. Even if there's no ice left today, a fjord has been carved out and you see evidence that the glaciers were once there. So why are hanging valleys so cool? First of all, they're beautiful. They typically have gorgeous waterfalls, which is why we see these waterfalls in fjords. But let me be clear, you do not have to have a fjord to have a hanging valley. What they are, are U-shaped valleys that represent where the current tributary floor, whose lowest point rests way above where the current stream valley exists. In other words, current stream valley in this picture in Argentina would be way down here, and you may have a stream bed up here and up here. The stream did not create this. An ancient valley glacier did. And now if streams were to flow, they would create waterfalls where this location is. So they're very beautiful, and hanging valleys can only be made with valley glaciers. In Milford Sound, here's a beautiful fjord, and you can see the hanging valley that's way up here. So this is the, even though it's not a stream, it's where the fjord is. The embayment's down here, but yet a stream is way up here, and as it melts, it's producing, or flowing, it's producing that waterfall. That's a hanging valley. All right, cirques. Some people pronounce them cirques, cirques, either way is fine. But cirques are the bowl-shaped depressions at the heads of valley glaciers where the original ice developed. So it carves out this really deep uh, depression at the top of the heads of valley glaciers. Remember, heads are the origin points of valley glaciers. So if you like to bowl ski, you're, in a, you're skiing in a cirque. And uh, so... Once the snow or ice is completely gone, that valley glacier produces this, and it you'll see it as a cirque or a depression at the top of the mountain. If you still see snow there or glaciers, then it's an active head of a glacier. So when a cirque fills up with water, we call that a tarn, and it makes a unique lake where the head of the valley glacier used to be, or the cirque. Another really cool feature that valley glaciers make in not continental ones are where you get two valley glacier carving down the same mountain. And when it does, it makes a very steep knife-like ridge like you see right here in the Southern Alps in New Zealand. This is the plane that I was in when I took this picture. And they're both carving down the same edge. So it makes a profile that's very sharp. That's called an areet. An areet, uh, I've, I've done some mountain climbing and you would hike along these uh, profiles right in here to get to the summit. 
This up here would be a cirque, by the way, just so you can kind of see that. The last really important valley glacier is called a horn. And I want to talk about this and how they form. I've added the arrows because I want you first, the black arrow, to show you that's the horn. <laughs> the very pointed feature, like a horn. But people often are perceiving how these things formed. Valley glaciers, remember the cirques are up here, the heads of the valley glaciers. And they're traveling down over time as the zone of accumulation causes that to grow in length. So let's say that your terminus was right here. The cirques were up here. You'd have a cirque here, a cirque here. You typically, for a horn, need at least two, if not three, usually three or four, because it's carving down a very steeple-like structure. But the point is, is that ice doesn't grow up the mountain. Ice grows down from the head of the glacier up here down to the terminus or the toes of a glacier. So whenever you see a horn, you know that multiple valley glaciers, at least two, usually three or four, if not more, are going down the same um, mountain, carving it out almost like a steeple or a horn. They're very distinct. They have very steep walls and a summit at the very top. Here's the horns and Grand Tetons. Can you now begin to see how that formed? Remember, the ice starts at the cirques and grows downward. And in this case, you had at least, I would say, three valley glaciers that carved this particular one down. Let's shift gears and talk about continental glacier features. Now, the beauty of continental glacier features are all in the eyes of the beholder. But continental glaciers give scientists a lot of information. Not just the two current ones we have in Greenland and Antarctica. Greenland's on the left and on the right here. But notice that the thickness of the ice varies from what you've seen in the valley glaciers. And that's part of the story of Remember that continental glaciers don't have big giant uh, mountains that restrict them. You go, well, what are these? While they do have mountains here, the ice is spreading out everywhere. So it's going to reach the ocean in either case of Antarctica or Greenland. And in the last ice age, the continental glaciers came onto land in the United States out of Canada or Alaska. So continental glaciers make a couple of deposits that are very unique to them in landscapes that we look for. So if you found something called drumlins, these are these unique little features right here. I shouldn't call them little though. They can be like a kilometer or a couple kilometers long and wide. They form where continental glaciers deposit till the sediments get reworked over time by weathering or as the ice travels over the land beneath the glacial ice creating these oblong looking features almost like you have a spoon of peanut butter and you turned it upside down that's what these features look like drumlins so this one's actually in new york and if you look all the way up through the upper midwest and the northeast you'll see drumlins and they're very uh good indicators that continental glaciers used to exist there. Cames. These are continental glacial features where crevasses fill up with glacial silt, gravel, and sand. And as the glacier partially melts, these sediments get deposited as poorly sorted glacial till. This is a mound in Scotland where continental glaciers deposited this. So you get basically a big old hole like a crevasse and as that starts to melt, you get the sediments that uh, were in the ice that fall in and any sediments that were on top. And they fill that up and they make these little mounds of material. And again, they're not so little. That's all perspective, right? They're actually fairly large. Eskers are another cool thing that continental glaciers can form. They represent long, windy ridges of glacial sediment by melting waters of a retreating glacier. And so they're basically the glacial streams that form in the ice and they leave behind these sediments that look like long stretches of winding, uh, much thinner, not as broad and tall, but they certainly uh, stand up in the landscape. So that's an esker. Another continental glacial feature you'll see is something called Kettle Lakes. 
These are different than tarns. Let me explain why. Tarns are unique to valley glaciers because they represent cirques that fill up with water. But cattle lakes, when you get a block of ice in a continental glacier that becomes buried by glacial sediment, that water's still there. And over time, it's going to make the sediment collapse into that hole. And the water on top of it or any rainfall that falls after that will accumulate in those holes and the depressions made by the continental glaciers. And these are all kettle lakes right here. These are kettle lakes in Alaska. So um, remember, Alaska was once covered by a continental ice pack known as uh, the Cordilleran. So an interesting fact about Alaska is the state of a million lakes. And one of the reasons is it's filled with a lot of kettle lakes. That brings us to glacial issues. So I don't want to alarm you, but glaciers are melting. Newsflash, right? You probably heard a lot about that if you've been follow the news. And a lot of people seem to think it's a bunch of hogwash. So I'd like to share the scientific perspective on this and recognize that there's political issues associated with it, but the scientific one matters for this class. This is a sign uh, from if you went to Logan's Pass, which is the highest point in the Montana side of Glacier National Park. It's where Boulder Glacier exists. And this is the sign that the park ranger puts out because they do on most days, they provide a discussion, like a, a free public discussion about climate change and how it's affected Boulder Glacier, which is at Logan's Pass. And I'd like you to look at the 1932 photograph of the terminus of Boulder Glacier and then look at 1988 and you can imagine what it looks like now in this millennium. And that is the result of climate change. So we have to talk about climate change because glaciers help regulate the Earth's climate. I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion on glaciers that they capture pollution. So that can be aerosols from, let's say, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, any kind of dirt that's in the atmosphere, we call that um, particulate matter. Any kind of metal or anything that may be in the air that you can't see. Volcanic ash, that would be another example. So glacial ice is cored, literally, humans drill into our two existing ice packs, and even some of our, uh, meaning our ice packs, our continental ice packs, ice sheets. We also can drill into glaciers that are valley glaciers and see a record of climate. And I want to notice the dark line here, and then you can see some of these uh, lines where you could, it's almost like barbs. It represents seasonal changes in these glaciers. But what if this line right here of sediment contained a substantial amount of something like carbon, methane? That tells scientists a lot because we can actually tell you when volcanic events occurred. We can tell you about carbon concentrations by looking at the depth of ice cores. And the ice core area that we have the most continuous record of ice is actually in Greenland. Even though the ice is older in Antarctica, there's been some uh, warming at the South Pole in different periods of time that has not left for a perfect continuous record. But it doesn't go back as far as we would probably like it to. So while Greenland only captures the last 130,000 years, it's a continuous record. There's no interruptions. And that means we can totally see climate conditions as it's waned and, and meaning we have uh, interglacial periods, which are warmer periods, and then we have the glacial periods. We can see all of those changes in the ice. While Antarctica holds about 800,000 years of record, it's not continuous. And it's super valuable, though. Neither one is without its merit in helping scientists piece together what's happened over the last several hundred thousand years in terms of climate. And then we can go to sediments themselves, like in the ocean and in lakes and on land, to help us investigate further back in geologic time. 
But anyway, glaciers do capture pollution and ice cores are super definitive because they hold the chemistry of what was in the air when these molecules were frozen. Which brings me to a discussion about the Earth's albedo. One of the first things you might have noticed when I showed you some of the pictures like in Argentina of that very bright glacier was how white it was and that it was highly reflective. You would want to wear sunglasses if you were out there. Albedo is a term that scientists use to describe the reflectiveness of Earth's surface. The more or the higher the albedo, the more reflective it is. The lower the albedo, the darker it is, and the more solar energy is absorbed at the Earth's surface. In short, this refers to the Earth's energy budget. Why is that important? Because it's all how the Earth regulates carbon. So darker surfaces like forests, even oceans themselves, dark oceans, they tend to absorb uh, energy. Lighter surfaces like you see here, glaciers, and even uh, light-colored sands can reflect light very well. But think about that, because glaciers, as they shrink, you're going to have darker land surfaces underneath them. So the Earth is going to actually absorb more energy, making the climate warmer. When you have more glaciers, there's more reflective surface, so it actually helps send more solar radiation back to space, cooling the climate. So we know over geologic time, millions of years, even billions of years, there is records of ancient climate change. And we know that we've had multiple ice ages. We've also had multiple global warmings. One in particular global warming event stands out above the rest. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So basically, this is what I was wanting you to see. When you don't have those glacial surfaces, the starker land is going to reflect less. You see the 20% reflected, 10% by the sea ice, and 70% is absorbed by land. When you see the opposite on the glacier, you see how much is reflected and, and the small amount that's absorbed. That equates to how warm the Earth's atmosphere or cold the atmosphere is gonna be. So greenhouse gases actually store more heat in, up in this part in the atmosphere before it ever reaches the ground surface. So the more heat we have captured in the atmosphere can affect either one of these situations. So the less we have, then we'll probably be growing more of this. The more we have, the less this has the chance of survival. It'll blate, it'll melt, and it will become a darker surface. So this is that park ranger I was talking about uh, at um, Logan's Pass in Glacier National Park talking about climate change. And the Earth's albedo in conjunction with higher global mean temperatures caused by a higher concentration of greenhouse gases, specifically carbon, causes most glacial systems to melt. And not all, some are still growing, others are what I would call a stable stage and many are, re are ablating or melting. So what does this really mean to us when we start to think about it as humans? Reduced glaciers, whether it's valley glaciers or continental glaciers, remember glaciers are formed by snowfall, right? So if we have reduced snowfall, we're also going to have reduced snow melt at the end of each season in valley glaciers in particular in the mountainous regions. That creates what we call snow melt runoff. Snow melt is essential for several things. One is it helps provide water for rivers and lakes and also helps recharge groundwater systems. So when you have reduced snow, snow melt, now you have reduced amounts of water going into rivers like the Colorado River you learned about in uh, our last prior stuff about fluvial and with the compact for the Colorado River. And this area is in the Sierra Nevadas right here, which is part of the Colorado River and also part of the equation of the compact that you learned about. And less ice, snow coverage, snow melt means less water. And this area of the country is growing by leaps and bounds. So more people demanding on the water, 
less water available, and remember that compact exists, which delineates who gets what, it's a mess. So it's not just in the United States. This is a worldwide problem. I think about the second most populated place in the world, India. A majority of their surface water comes from melting of the Himalayas, like uh, Mount Everest. And the glaciers up there, as they are having reduced snow melt, that means these people are not having enough water. They can't grow enough crops. They don't have enough water in general for people. So the human implications of this are enormous. That brings me to a discussion about carbon. So you might have heard that methane holds a lot more heat than carbon. That is absolutely true. Like, depending on how much, it can be like 80 times more heat capacity. The difference is there's so much more carbon naturally and anthropogenically, which is when I say anthropogenic, I mean human caused. So pre-industrial levels of carbon were around 280 parts per million. So that's, you're looking back in the 1700s. So as we started to learn about coal, as we started to create greenhouse gases by the burning of fossil fuels, our amount of carbon started to increase after that segment of time. Now, to get into the heart of the matter where glacial issues are concerned, we gotta talk about the climate change and the carbon concentrations. So you've likely know by this point in your life and have learned that methane holds a substantial amount more heat capacity than carbon. That is true. It can be up to 80 times more. It's amazing. So that's one reason methane is regulated. At the current time, may change in the future, but carbon dioxide is not regulated by the Clean Air Act in the United States. And you may wonder why. Why are all these other things regulated but carbon dioxide isn't since we're most worried about CO2? Well, carbon comes from a lot of natural places. And one of the depressing things as a geologist is thinking about limestone. <laughs> Limestone holds more carbon in the carbon reservoir than everything else put together. Like 99.9% .9 of all carbon is housed in rocks like limestone. So as we crush limestone, use it for building materials and so forth, we're releasing that carbon back to the atmosphere. As carbon uh, heats up our oceans, because our oceans help regulate the Earth's climate, it makes limestone, stores it away as limestone or similar rocks, carbonate rocks. And as the ocean warms back up, it begins to acidify. And as you learned about karsting, that releases the carbon dioxide back out. So over time, we have this exacerbated problem with climate change related to rocks. Then you add that with the human component of greenhouse gases being added uncontrollably to the atmosphere. There is some control, I should say, in different countries, especially um, more modernized countries, ones that are more industrialized, what I mean, where they may and hopefully have air emission standards. But again, carbon dioxide is the key. So pre-industrial levels back in the 17, mid 1700s were around 280 parts per million of carbon. Then we discovered coal. We started burning fossil fuels like coal and kerosene and other types of fuel sources, and we began to emit carbon into the atmosphere. And our current carbon levels are at about 412 parts per million. You're like, oh, that isn't so, that isn't so different. It's substantially different. And what happens is we've been able as scientists to piece together from prior global warming events by sediments and looking at carbon and ice cores. What happens when we double the pre-industrial levels of carbon? Every time we double that 280 number, we get a one degree Celsius rise in global mean temperature. So this is a look of the late past 800,000 years, and that number is significant because of that Antarctic ice cores I was talking about. And you can see ups and downs, ups and downs. 
The upper parts that say warm interglacial periods, notice that each time we get one of these, we get a higher concentration. This is your carbon dioxide parts per million. And this is where we are in 2019. And then in 2020, we've reached the 412 mark and it's just continuing to go up. What does this mean and why should you care? Climate scientists have cited that the Earth is already 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels. That doesn't seem like a big jump. But in 2020, it was the second warmest year on record since we've been actually measuring temperature in a scientific way. The key is when does it cause the glaciers to melt? Because remember, glaciers link back to the Earth's reflectivity or its albedo. And the less or less reflective the surface, the more surface temperature, the hotter it gets because we absorb more solar radiation and don't reflect it back to space as well. So around 55.8 million years ago, the worst global warming event happened on record. And that's well before any known fossils of hominoids existed, meaning humans and any, any other relatives for that matter. It was called the PETM, which stands for the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. When you take historical, we'll, we'll have a case study about this because it's a big deal. Here's why it affected biological life. So this massive warming happened. And it appears that there were some methane clathrates, which are basically big pockets of methane and volcanic activity in conjunction that released a bunch of CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases, causing the atmosphere to warm up fairly quickly over a period of uh, tens of thousands of years. It reached a level in the atmosphere, meaning carbon, at a thousand parts per million. We can base that on sediments that we can find that give us that information. But what's remarkable is what happened to the biological life. Certain plants could grow, things in the bean family, for example, but not much else. The animals shrunk, mammals shrunk in stature. For example, grazing animals that would have been the sizes of horses normally shrunk down to the size of dogs and cats. Why? We could hypothesize it's because the food resource nutrients were not very good can't 100% prove that, but we can. what we can prove is that the fossil record clearly shows that the animals shrunk in size, and that's important. So that thousand parts per million, let's go back. Remember, we've already reached that like 412-ish parts per million right now, and I said every time you double pre-industrial levels of carbon, we raise a, or rise a degree Celsius in temperature. That means we'd only need a three degree to five degree Celsius increase to basically get our global mean temperature to a place that it would be like the PETM. Actually, it would be worse than that. And that means no glaciers. They'd all be gone. Think about what that means to the Earth's albedo, to the surface temperatures that we have on Earth. And this diagram right here is showing you a pattern, even since 1975 to where we are right now. And you're starting to see this remarkable growth in carbon concentrations. So one of the big factors about more carbon in the atmosphere and it warming each degree it warms, we get rising seas because like our continental glaciers, our two big ice packs, Green, Greenland and Antarctica and the sea ice, it melts. And when that happens, it causes sea level to rise. So about 3 million years ago, there's a pretty good record that climate warming occurred causing sea level to rise between 15 to 25 meters. So there's three feet in a meter. That would be about 75 feet at max higher sea level than what we have today. And that only happened with a two to three degree increase Celsius. So from, that's pre-industrial temperatures, from pre-industrial temperatures. So what would a modern day three to five degree rise in sea level look like? How would that affect our glaciers and what does that mean to humans? So this is a look at, you can see one degree in different colors of blue, two degree rise, three degree rise, four degree rise. And what you should be noticing, this is the state of Florida. You can begin to see that highly populated areas 
are at high risk for flooding of rising seas. There are parts of the globe that are already, uh, places that exist at sea level or close to it are already flooding out. Dur during the pandemic, you might recall that very famous places in Italy were flooded out in museums that people visit that they spend money to go as tourists to see were completely inundated by high tides that reached places that they hadn't in modern time because of rising seas from melting glaciers. So let's apply what you know. How would glacial melting impact the Arctic region habitats? You are you're like, oh, well, polar bears, I get that. Well, polar bears rely on sea ice and they look for sea seals, literally their holes where mammals, meaning seal mammals, <laughs> come up to the surface for air and they're waiting at those holes to get the seals for lunch. They're having to swim further to get that. Some of them starve and die along the way. If it's a mother polar bear, can the babies make it back to land? That's just one example. There's habitat changes in the Arctic region that are forcing animals to go higher in elevation. Eventually, there's not going to be a place high enough where they can live in areas that they're adapted to. So either they go extinct or they have to find a way to evolve. That's the message. How does that relate to humans? Well, you may not live in the Arctic, but it is impactful when you start to look at communities that do live in the Arctic region and how climate change is affecting them with mass wasting, uh, literally avalanches, you name it, they're facing these problems. But I think we should be worried more about where you are currently living and how it's going to affect you as humans, because as coastal communities start to flood out, these people have to go somewhere, and they're going to move inland. That's just the way it works. So you learned about the Ogallala Aquifer, which is all in this section right here, which grows like the Panhandle of Texas all the way up and through Kansas, Nebraska, and parts of South Dakota. When more humans are reliant upon that resource, and it's used for our primary agricultural growth, what are we going to do? How are we going to irrigate those crops to feed the people? So maybe we could learn from the PETM and be concerned about the carbon concentrations and what it meant to mammals back in the PETM and what it could mean for humans. It may not happen right away, but you need to seriously be watching this because you need to choose a place wisely to live that won't be flooded out by rising seas because it's happening already and it's a problem. You can make a difference. You can't solve everything, but there's some things you can do. Maybe reduce your ecological footprint of how much carbon you emit to the atmosphere. Each person does a little bit of their fair share. It makes a difference holistically. Participate in a rideshare program where you're not using as much fossil fuels. Consider purchasing an electric or hybrid vehicle to release less emissions that would produce less carbon to the atmosphere. Don't idle your vehicle. That releases quite a bit of emissions. Instead, turn it off. Maybe start contributing as a volunteer to an area of conservation and supporting uh, the research that happens on climate so we have a better understanding of it. You're not going to solve all of the issues, but I wanted you to see that glaciers matter. They matter to humans across the board. And our human population cannot withstand a PETM-like global warming event. It will tank population because there just will not be enough food and water resources for all the things that we need to work. You're like, well, we'll be melting all the glaciers. We'll have more water. Well, most of it's going to be ocean water, so we'd have to treat it anyway. The surface water is already an imminent threat out west and through the southwest, as you've learned, through the Colorado River Compact. So this is an issue that really does hit home, one that you should care about, and one that may affect where you choose to live. Water is important in protecting our glaciers so we can keep this reflectivity surface intact as long as possible is important to the survival of mammals, humans included. And if that changes, we'll see a change in 
what can survive that kind of climate change. As you think about this, and maybe you have concerns or you have questions, email me. Meet me on my office hours and we can talk about this. I want to see if you can figure out what we're looking at here. Do you see this? What is that? If you call it a U-shaped valley, it is, but it's a special type. Remember the ones that hang way up in the sky? See these cascading glaciers? <laughs> That's a hanging valley. Can you see this big, broad U-shaped valley here? While there are no glaciers there today, there were in geologic past in the last ice age. Hope this was informative for you to learn the difference between the features and the deposits of different types of glaciers. Why glaciers give us an insight into geologic past, the climate conditions, and what we need to do to care about the ones we have right now. Thanks so much for your time. Bye.